Ida, thanks. Okay, so you're all very welcome. We're here, and um, this is kind of our lunchtime event if you're in Ireland or the UK for um, our virtual Data Plus Women Ireland quarter one, 2023. So the agenda that you'll probably have seen as um, when you signed up, but just to kind of give you an overview. So I'll do a quick introduction. And then we're going to hear from Emma Scollin from Quidel Ortho, who um, the title of her presentation is Data with Integrity, the Ethics of Responsible Data Use. And then we're going to hear from Deborah Contente um, from the Information Lab Ireland. And Deborah's going to talk to us about data risks and pitfalls. And then we'll have some uh, Q&A at, at the end. Um, so I won't talk for too long, but just a little bit about Data Plus Women for anyone who hasn't come across it before. If this is your first event. Um, so the Data Plus Women initiative set up at a Tableau conference in 2014, um, so almost 10 years ago. And um, this is the mission. So it's um, so Data Plus Women provides a platform for all data and analytics enthusiasts to learn new skills share experiences and broaden their networks while elevating women working in data. So everybody's welcome to these events. Um, so it's all genders. Um, but the idea is to create opportunities for um, women, people identifying as women to speak and listen to others and, and connect with like minded people. Um, so just a quick overview of some of the chapters across Europe. Um, we're Data Plus Women Ireland. So my name is Louise Shorten um, and I work with the Information Lab and I'm the, my two co-organizers are Katie Kilroy from Arlo Technologies and Michelle Gork from Optum. So we've set up the Irish chapter and um, started in 2018. And our goal is to organize quarterly events. Um, if anyone's inter interested in speaking at future events, we're always keen to, um, to get any suggestions. So do reach out um, via the chat or on the Q&A, um, or you can reach out to me over LinkedIn or Twitter. So um, just to highlight once again, so the chat is there if you just want to say hi, um, and then there's Q&A. Uh, we'll take questions then after we hear from our two speakers um, at the very end. So you can put any questions into the, the Q&A box. Um, so then our speakers, um, first up, we're going to hear from Emma Scollin, as I said, and Emma is a global data enablement lead at Quidel Ortho. And, um, then we'll, she'll be followed by Deborah Contente, um, who's a colleague of mine, and she Deborah's lead trainer at the Information Lab. So Emma, I'll hand over to you. I'll stop my screen share. Okay. Wait, just get my deck up. Okay, can you see my screen? Okay. We can. Yeah. Thanks. Coming up. Okay. Um, so uh, thanks, uh, Louise, for the for the introduction and for inviting me to speak. Um, uh, my um, name is Emma Scallon, as I said. My background is actually in computational linguistics, but I've spent many years in program management and delivery management of large scale cognitive um, data science and automation programs for the IT industry. Um, and I suppose just to give you a bit of background as to why I'm talking about this today. As these programs developed, I became quite interested in the ethics behind some of the technologies that were being created. Um, and that encouraged me to then go and study in a bit more detail and complete a master's in ethics uh, last year. Um, and I've always been fascinated by the intersection between the humanities and technology. So I'm delighted to talk to you on this topic today about data ethics. Um, and the purpose is really just to give you a high level overview of why ethics is important when we talk about data and AI, but also what are the key concepts that we should keep in mind when we're working and using um, data. So hoping you'll find it um, useful. Uh, so in the interest of time, I will crack on. So what is ethics? So we start at the very basics. <clears throat> so ethics um, in its broadest sense refers to the concern that humans have always had for figuring out how best to live. And it is something that has been around for thousands of years, this uh, kind of background in philosophy and this discipline in terms of how to think about how to be, what's right and wrong in the work that we do and the decisions we make. Um, and it, now ethics is the discipline that has arisen that helps us navigate that and, and how to examine our rational justification for our moral judgments. So it studies what's morally right or wrong, just or unjust. And without going into too much detail about this, because you could spend um, years <laughs> discussing ethical theories, but there's three main ones. Um, consequentialism, which is the claim that we're morally obligated to act in ways that produce the best outcomes. Um, which would be very much a utilitarian kind of view of the world that you're trying to um, create the greatest happiness for the greatest number of people. <clears throat> and that by that, it makes it right or wrong. 
um, deontology, which is claiming our moral obligations are in some way independent of the consequences. Um, and then we have virtue theory, which has been around for thousands of years, um, which is all about how to be the best human that you can be and how to flourish and, and be a good person. Um, and that is thanks to Aristotle, I think, who kicked that one off. <clears throat> so what does all of this have to do with data? Um, ethics is a very academic discipline, um, but uh, ha and trying to understand how data might fit into it is quite interesting. Um, it, in today's world, obviously, there's a few commodities as crucial as data, the new oil, as people call it. Um, and the data is both created and used by a lot of our newer technologies. Most AI and sophisticated technologies rely on large data sets to provide human insights. And big data is the common term that we use to, to um, encompass that explosive growth of digital data sets that are being collected. Um, however, how that's been applied um, to the new technologies that we're creating is quite interesting. And there is a lot of um, thought these days that technology is not actually neutral. It's increasingly seen to shape how we seek the good life and with what degree of success. It reflects our values through our design choices and the use of the application. So well-designed, well-used technologies can make it easier for people to live well by allowing more efficient use of um, essential resources or better um, distribution of food, water, or energy. Poorly designed misuse technologies can make it harder to live well by toxifying our environment or by reinforcing unsafe or unhealthy antisocial habits. So technologies are not are beginning to no longer be considered ethically neutral, for they reflect the values that we bake into them with our design choices, as well as the values which guide our distribution and use of them. They both reveal and shape what humans value and what we think is good in life and worth seeking. So within this <clears throat> wider sphere of ethics, data ethics is the branch that is looking at specifically around data practices, collecting, generating, analyzing, and disseminating data, and how that can um, uh, impact people in society. And we can see the impact of big data on society all around us. Um, the speed and scale and pervasiveness of um, our technologies is, is huge. Um, and we've had many inventions um, over the millennia that we've been around, but I think none that are having such a dramatic impact on what it's like to be um, human or how we live and how we communicate. Um, and there's lots of positives around these new technologies in terms of efficiencies, and, but there's also some pitfalls and negatives also. Um, just to take a couple of the big areas that, that we would look at in data and ethics, surveillance technology would be a huge one. Um, and it's a term used to describe a lot of newer tooling, such as spatial recognition tools or public um, health tracking applications, which we all encountered during the pandemic. And just to give you the flavor of some of the, why we're interested in some of these, these tools. Whilst in Ireland, our um, experience of digital tracking applications was relatively controlled. We had good privacy preserving design. In other countries, this wasn't always the case. Um, China, for example, you received a color coded health code, which stated whether you could travel inside or outside of your area on your smartphone. Um, Israel repurposed their counter terrorism infrastructure to track iPhone movements of people that they may, you may have been in contact with 14 days previously. Um, and wristbands were also used, I think, in Hong Kong to ensure that quarantines were being enforced. So you had this kind of um, digital electric fence, as they would call it. Um, so there was a lot of um, a lot of implications with some of these new technologies that nations were bringing on screen to try and protect citizens. Now, facial recognition, obviously, we know that we use it every day on our phones or we're logging into things, um, but it's also been used in lots of other ways, both positively and negatively by justice systems or by um, state actors as well, um, uh, and, and it, it has um, been proven that it doesn't always have the same effect depending on the data set it's been trained on. So there's been numerous um, computer citations which most people would know that it doesn't it doesn't necessarily work particularly well on women of color, particularly um, that there can be a lot of issues around that. So so these are areas that we look at when we're when we're talking about ethics and the tooling that we're creating on the back of our big data. Um, Business tooling, I think we're all going to be aware of that. That's pervasive and probably some of us are working on some of these tools in terms of the ADMS systems that, that are behind them, which <clears throat> were brought into speed of decisions and, and create efficiencies within our organizations. Um, and there was also a belief they'd eliminate bias and human error, but not necessarily the case depending on how they're developed and how they've been trained. Um, if the data set used to train these algorithm models um, has any kind of historical bias, um, it can it can skew the results coming out of them. So, you know, going in and applying for a job through the HR system that's using a HR algorithm 
um, loan approvals, insurance applications, they're all ADMS systems that are potentially making decisions um, on the back of data sets that may or may not um, have been trained or created appropriately. Um, the justice um, area is another area that is starting to get quite embedded in with these new technologies. Um, there's a lot of, uh, particularly in the US, uh, predictive algorithms that are being used to try and understand where criminal activity or potential locations um, criminal activity may happen. Um, Credpull, I think, was the name of the tool that was, was rolled out there. However, research has shown um, that, that in some cases uh, it wasn't really achieving um, the ultimate objective to try and reduce crime because the data set was including a lot of misdemeanors such as vagrancy or graffiti um, that were included in the training data set and it, it created kind of a feedback loop um, validating existing patterns of policing so you ended up with over policing certain neighborhoods and as, as a result more arrest as a result their algorithm kept sending them back to that neighborhood so there was Things like that, which which need to be taken into account when when some of these, um, particularly in the justice area, tools are are being rolled out. Uh, the recidivism risk calculator was something else that was used in the US, um, where judges were using to try and decide whether to release people on bail. Um, and what they found after investigating it um, through numerous legal challenges, in fact, was that it was proven to more falsely predict black defendants of future criminals at twice the rate of white defendants. Um, and white defendants were more likely to be mislabeled as low risk, but go on to reoffend um, than black defendants. So there was there was a historical bias in there based on the the, the data that had been training the model <clears throat> that resulted in incorrect um, results coming out of that that risk calculator. So those types of technologies, which are all encompassing, pervade pretty much every area of our society now, have generated a certain amount of data ethics concerns. Um, and I'm sure everybody's aware that there's a new AI um, ethics regulation coming out soon. They're in the middle of, of <clears throat> discussing it, but the, the legal regulation is having an awful time at keeping up with the speed and the scale of the new technology that's going out. Um, that's coming out. So, um, and and understanding how these guidelines will be enforceable, how they can, how far they will go, is something that they're in the process of um, discussing. Uh, for example, I think despite the fact that it's an AI. Um, system they were asking to have some kind of red lines in there around autonomous weapon systems i don't think that's going to be in there so there's a lot of discussion going on around that ai um, ethics uh, regulation that's going through the eu and eu leads the forefront in this because of our data privacy um, legislation um, data ownership is a big area um, who owns the data how it's collected is the purpose clearly stated would be an area of concern um, a lot of our data can be sold on to third parties to use it for research or other purposes. We have to ask the questions whether there's informed consent and transparency of use there. Uh, disinformation, <clears throat> fake news has become obviously uh, a massive area, which I think also people are, are um, very aware of, particularly since the US elections and the scandals around Cambridge Analytica and all that kind of stuff. A lot of data that was freely given was, was manipulated um, and, um, and then used for targeted um, uh, messages sent to, to particular people through social media. Um, algorithmic bias and objectivity is something that um, data ethics spends an awful lot of time on it. Um, whether we have historical bias um, in our data that we've collected to train a particular model, um, how um, whether we're misrepresenting any historical practices. Um, or whether the data might be biased because of a misrepresentation of historical practices. Uh, it, that can be a kind of a selection bias, whether we've got um, underrepresented populations, whether we're using we have confirmation bias within there. There's an awful lot of them um, of different areas around bias that we need to think about when we are dealing with data and try and put the right mitigation in place to, to catch that. Um, the big data divide is something that's also been quite um, discussed recently because of the access to technology that a lot of people don't actually have so there's gaps in our data we're not necessarily um, representing everybody if there's a portion of our um, population um, <clears throat> globally or um, within country that don't have access to the level of technology to, to the same level as, as um, others so and that can result in, in a number of different um, problems in terms of underrepresentation the classification of minorities and data sets might not be well represented 
And the data emissions don't always cause direct harm, but were you using a limited source to generate insights about a larger population to provide a service at scale, emissions can have negative impacts and it's important we understand that. And the last issue there is around the risk to autonomy and privacy. And privacy is obviously enshrined under human rights law and is deemed quite important for us, uh, for us to, to ensure that we're making autonomous decisions about ourselves um, and not being unduly influenced or manipulated. And one of the reasons I chose this picture over here on the left is <clears throat> it was, um, it's, a, it's actually the design for a prison uh, that Jeremy Bentham, who was a leading um, philosopher back in the mid 18th century designed. And the idea was that in the, in the watchtower in the middle, you had the prison wardens and all around in the kind of circular effect, you have the um, prisoners who can all be seen by the prison wardens, but the prisoners can't see the wardens themselves. So they never know when they're being watched or not. And therefore they start to alter their behavior on the basis that they are constantly being surveilled. Um, and it was a mode of surveillance and social control that <clears throat> was debated and discussed about in philo philosophical and architectural circles back, back in the day. This idea that you don't know if you're being watched, therefore you are altering your behavior and therefore you, you're, that, that link between privacy and autonomy is kind of broken. Um, so it's, it's, it's quite an interesting um, thought experiment at the moment, uh, particularly as people talk about a digital panopticon where you know we're constantly generating a lot of information about ourselves on the web and also creating these um, different uh, personas of ourselves through social media where people are looking at us and we don't know what they're saying or what they're thinking so we, we have to alter our behavior sometimes um, in the social sphere and digitally to accommodate for that. So that, that's kind of where we're, you know, just to summarize the, where we are from a concerns perspective and, and the types of tools and technologies in our society. So some of the concepts that kind of sit behind this that we try to then work on um, and that the a lot of the regulation that comes out, a lot of the digital uh, data ethics frameworks that come out trying to look at are around three particular areas, um, transparency, fairness and accountability. And whether you're developing AI or using data to create visualizations, there's some basic ethical concepts that you need to keep be aware of and keep in mind. And, and transparency would be the first one, um, that your actions and processes um, and your data is made open to inspection by publishing how you've, how you've reached your conclusion, how you've developed your tool, how you've created your visualization. Either you can use GitHub, you can publish metadata about your model, um, you know, can you can you make any of this data publicly available so people can have trust in how it was done and the um, variables that were included in it. Um, and if some of the data is sensitive, there are ways of, of getting around that. You can arrange for selected external bodies approved by your organization to examine the model to make sure it's, you know, um, uh, doing what, what it in, you intended to do um, and allow them to provide feedback. Uh, fairness is obviously um, very important. It's crucial to eliminate any potential to have um, discriminatory effects on individuals and social groups. So therefore we have to aim to, to mitigate um, bias as much as possible. Um, and that may influence the project. Explainability is extremely important in ensuring fairness of the algorithm in order to identify any of the potential biases in the training data. And then finally, accountability, which means there are effective governance and oversight mechanisms for any project. Um, and uh, we understand uh, how the decisions and actions are being taken by an organization. So some of the key areas that we want to look at in data collection and use when we are working with data is really to understand um, the intent for the data collection, who's defining the objective, um, the problem, the solution, what assumptions the person have, are the users informed, able to make um, decisions as a result. Um, can we work to preserve privacy when working with the data? Obviously, we have some basic um, regulations we need to apply to, particularly in the EU, that depending on what type of data you're looking at, um, you could have to um, adhere to other regulations, particularly if you're dealing with medical data. Um, developers should only be applying design techniques or should be applying design techniques such as obviously encryption and anonymization is needed and always ensuring transparency and soliciting feedback. Um, the more feedback you get, the stronger your, your models and your um, use of data would be because you will understand it in a deeper sense. Uh, data minimization, uh, not something every organization does. Sometimes people collect data because they can, um, but we really should be collecting what we need as opposed to what we can. Um, ensuring the data doesn't result in discrimination of bias. Again, I think some uh, academics have, or, and CEOs, in fact, have said you can avoid bias by starting to recognize that it exists. 
both in the data itself and the people who are analyzing and using it. But if you are going to collect data yourself, ensuring your survey questions are constructed by people without a particular um, intent or framing, avoid hearing what you want to hear, um, avoid selectively collecting data from groups of particular backgrounds, and understand the bias of people from whom the data is sourced. What gets counted counts. So learn how to represent gaps in your data ethically. There will be gaps in form. Um, so how are you going to um, how are you going to cater for that uh, within your within your um, your model or your visualization or your um, tool? Try and rethink binaries. Um, things are not as black and white as they used to be in terms of gender, race, or anything else. There's a lot of um, nuances that a lot of time are not collected, and therefore we don't have the data to be able to uh, um, maybe make a full um, uh, have a full discussion and get full visibility into how we're using um, the tool. Understanding proxy variables. Um, proxy variables are quite important. They, you may think you're not dealing with sensitive data, but the, uh, the, a particular variable can allow conclusions about certain protected characteristics without recording the characteristics directly. For example, um, somebody says they have 30 years of work experience, it can indicate the person must be at least in their mid 40s. Um, and that could have a decisive influence on the decision of an ADM system for HR, for example, um, in terms of um, cloud. So um, there's a, a few things there that, that uh, we need to, to think about. If you're creating visualizations, learn how to represent uncertainty in a medium that has become synonymous with the truth. And I think that's very important because a lot of times people see graphs, um, data charts, bar charts, and they think this is, you know, um, solid, they can follow it. Um, it is not everybody has the same level of data literacy um, and will not necessarily understand or be able to question the chart in the same way. So um, being able to represent any kind of uncertainty in there so that it um, is quite important. You see that particularly when you um, see the models that are doing hurricane predictions. You'll see what they call, and scientists don't like it, it's called a cone of uncertainty, where it looks like the hurricane is going to um, move into this particular area. But actually what they're showing is it could go to the left of that area, to the right of that area, within this area. It doesn't mean everyone in the area is going to be hit by the hurricane, but it, it's not very easy for people who are not scientists to understand that. Um, Ensuring accountability, uh, put mechanisms in place to ensure responsible um, responsibility, accountability, audits, impact assessment, um, and be aware of the paradox of exposure. And particularly if you're working in the public sector, people who might benefit the most from being counted can also be harmed by some counting. Uh, for example, undocumented migrants who are um, in the, with the best intention in the world trying to create um, or look to where you should direct public services um, to people most in need. You're also collecting information that may be sensitive for those particular individuals, depending on how it's used. Um, and this brings us to the privilege hazard, where the acts of counting and classification as they relate to minority groups has to balance the harms and benefits. So uh, finally, for those of you who are thinking about um, learning a little bit more about this area or um, creating a data ethics framework um, within your organization, there's, there's many different types and there's lots out there. Um, and the internet or with various um, organizations that can, can direct you to, to setting these up. Um, but there's five kind of key areas they all tend to look at um, in some shape or form. The first would be around respect for individuals. Uh, data should not be collected or used in a way, um, or should always be collected and used in a way that respects the dignity, privacy, and autonomy of individuals. Uh, responsibility, individuals and organizations that collect and use data should take responsibility for the impact um, of their actions on others. And you see a lot more of that happening these days, particularly because we don't have a huge amount of regulation in this space. A lot of data scientists are self-regulating or maybe not trying to trying to learn a little bit more about this area and how to approach it, or indeed in some cases refusing to work in um, areas that they think may not be ethically responsible. Beneficence, data should be collected and used for the benefit of society and not solely for the benefit of individuals and organizations becomes quite important if you're in the public sector. Um, Non-malfeasance, data should not be collected or used in a way that harms individuals or groups, and justice. Data should be connected and used in a fair and equitable manner without discrimination and bias. Um, so in summary, just to hopefully keep us slightly on time, uh, data, data practices can significantly impact the quality of people's lives, and data practitioners need to be aware of this and need to learn to better anticipate potential harms and benefits so they could be effectively addressed, particularly in this day and age where we have access to so much data. 
um, both publicly and within our own organizations. Um, consider developing a data ethics policy for your organization. Um, you can use the data ethics frameworks um, that are there um, out there already, and there's a lot of good um, uh, links that you can go to to kind of get more information on this that I can, I can share with you. Um, Data ethics is important and from, from, from this perspective to even ensure the public's trust in how an organization collects, uses and shares data. So a policy can really help in um, reassuring people um, and allowing them to trust you. And you see that more and more often in some organizations. Follow human-centric guidelines. The lack of enforced regulation requires data practitioners to be a bit more active in promoting and defending ethical design. So we need to understand it a little bit more. And try and embed ethical design into all aspects of your data projects, which kind of brings us back to where we started in terms of our ethical theories. How do we maximize benefits and minimize harms? And um, what duties do we have as we design and develop? On whom will your tool the technology be used? Who might be harmed right and who will not be? And how will you know if you're wrong? Which is very important. And a lot of um I, I saw this online, which I thought was quite interesting. A few, few areas are talking about creating a Hippocratic oath for technology where we try and uphold the principles of autonomy, non-malfeasance, beneficence and justice. So I suppose I wanted to leave that as a as a as a thought for people going forward <clears throat> as to what what they might um, might guide your your coding as you go forward into the world. So I hope I've given you a flavor of some of the key issues around data ethics and how we might be more mindful of the pitfalls going forward. I've included this page here which gives you some information on further reading citations that if you're interested in this area, um, are, are some of them are very they're very easy reads some of them some of them are a bit more detailed um, uh, there's also some links there to organizations that work in this space that are constantly running events podcasts webinars um, all tech is human has a slack channel that anyone can join um, and you can get involved in their projects and contribute to them so it's a nice um, volunteering exercise to do on the side of um, your day job if assuming you have the time to do it um, so I, I'll leave that there for you as well if, if anyone wants to get a screen grab and Louise, I can share it after the call as well, if needed. So thank you very much. Thanks very much, Emma. That was really interesting. Um, the, the event is being recorded as well if anyone wants to go back in and um, look at the slides. But if you do share, we'll be we'll be linking this through our in the information like lab blog and we can add in any um links as well um, lots of food for thought there Emma lots to think about but um, but some kind of practical tips as well you know it's it was good to some takeaways there I think even just um, from listening to all of that so that was fantastic thanks um, there's a um, few comments in the chat so thanks for those so yeah Mary um, kind of saying it's massive responsibility around ethics and data um, agreed um, this is just a question there and micro we'll, we'll look at questions at the end actually um, and so, yeah, so if there's any questions that you have for Emma, if you wouldn't mind dropping them in the chat box, sorry, not the chat box, the Q&A, Q&A box, if you've got specific questions um, and we'll get to that at the end. Um, yeah, so thanks a million again, Emma, and I'll pass on to pass over to Deborah now. So Deborah, if you'd like to share your screen. Uh, we'll start sharing now. Hopefully everyone can see my screen. Yeah, looks good. Thanks, Deborah. Brilliant. So um, thank you everyone for joining and thank you, Emma. That was really interesting and definitely lots of food for thought. Um, this presentation is on data risks and pitfalls or uh, how can you be tricked by data? Uh, and I think it's very relevant, especially after Emma Emma's presentation where she mentioned how disinformation um, and how spreading misinformation uh, can be something very dangerous. Uh, and this is all about a couple of examples on how um, visualization and data can actually uh, be used to trick you uh, and to mislead you. So that's what we'll uh, see today. So I'll start by introducing myself. Uh, Louise has already done it, but uh, I'll just reiterate. I am Deborah, part of the Information Lab Ireland as well, uh, and I am a trainer. 
I started my data journey as a consultant, uh, but I really am passionate about data and sharing the, the knowledge with everyone is something I'm very interested in. Uh, so that's uh, what I'm focusing on now. Um, and one of the courses I deliver as well is uh, visual analytics. Uh, so kind of got some ideas from there as well. So some um, data visualization best practices that will avoid uh, doing the examples I'm about to show you. About this talk, the structure, it's a short one, so the, str the structure is also simple. I'll start with the why, uh, how the idea from this talk uh, came in, and then we'll talk about the actual risks and pitfalls, so the examples. So uh, I feel like I had to share the why because I feel it like it's a funny story, uh, which is I got the idea for this, for sharing this example, because my sister completely misled my younger brother. So my younger brother is 16 years old and he currently has a mustache and my sister is not a fan of it. And she keeps in insisting on him to take it off. So he doesn't agree. Uh, and she thought, okay, so I'm going to do a survey and I'm going to prove you with data that no one likes it, okay? So we were at a family lunch and her way of doing that survey was showing two pictures to everyone. And she had two pictures, one where my brother was smiling, posing, good lighting. It was at a wedding, so he was wearing a suit, very polished, and he didn't have a mustache, a mustache in that picture. Second picture, uh, he was in a car, uh, sleeping, uh, not very handsome, and he did have a mustache on. So I think you're probably getting where I'm going to get, which is my sister then proceeded to show everyone the two pictures. And the question was, okay, which picture of Antonio, my brother, which picture of Antonio do you prefer? That was her question. And surprise, surprise, everyone preferred the one where he was smiling and didn't have a mustache on, but that was not the focus of the question. Uh, which, when she presented the result to my brother, she said, see, everyone agrees, everyone prefers this because you are not wearing a mustache. You don't have a mustache on this one. Uh, so there we go. That was very shocking and completely misleading. And unfortunately, that's something that we see happening. Uh, this was just a funny example, but we see it in more serious matters. Uh, and that's why I thought compiling a couple of examples uh, would be good so that we can avoid it uh, when we are presented with the example, but also we can avoid it when we are creating and sharing data with others. So let's proceed to the example. The first um, kind of practice that sometimes can be done and we want to avoid is cherry picking. And we see this all the time in um, police movies where we have a detective that thinks, okay, he's the guilty person. So I'm going to disregard any proof that doesn't support that he's the guilty person, right? And we all hate the police for that, uh, the bad cop in the movies. <laughs> um, and we also want to make sure that that doesn't happen with data. So I have some examples. Here we have a chart where uh, we have some data and looking at this, it looks like we are always increasing, right? The data points over time, they are always increasing, right? Well, it looks like it. However, at the bottom, we have the misleading, so uh, what we have just seen. And on the left, we have the actual chart where there are no gaps. So what happened is that some of the years were omitted so that we only focus on the points where the data is actually uh, increasing. And it looks like over time, we have been having a steady increase when in reality, if we look at the picture on the left, that's not what happened. So making sure that we don't have gaps in our data, making sure that there's no gaps on the data we are looking at is one way we can avoid being misled like this. 
another example here uh, in politics. I feel like there's a lot of examples in there. Um, this is a screen grab from a tweet that I will show you next as well, um, which is just focusing on the US gas price. And by looking at this chart, it looks like the, the, the price has been decreasing. Um, okay, so that's what it looks like. However, let's see the whole story. So the chart that we just saw was this small one at the bottom. But in reality, this is what all data looks like. So there's definitely a lot of um, fluctuation uh, of gas prices. And uh, sorry, I forgot to uh, mentioned something very important, which was this was posted um, by uh, DCCC, uh, and it was supposedly to uh, talk about the Biden presidency. Uh, and that's why the next picture is just slicing the gas prices depending on the presidency. And we can see that even though in this chart that is trying to show that during Biden presidency, the, the gas price was decreasing, we can see then in the chart number, uh, chart C, that that was just a slight, a very small bit, a very small chunk of the chart. So that's another way. You can just kind of zoom in in the part that you're interested in and disregard the rest. And of course, that's also not a, a good thing to do and something to avoid. Final example in terms of cherry picking. Uh, I think most of us have seen some kind of advertisement like this. Nine out of 10 dentists recommend a specific toothpaste. And then right next to it, we see nine out of 10 dentists recommend completely different brands. <laughs> and we start thinking, okay, how, how is that possible? And it can be possible. It can be that dentists can recommend 500 toothpaste and therefore they will be just recommended the 500 toothpaste and each of those can create an advertisement like this which is very misleading we think yes this is the best toothpaste that exists in the world when in reality maybe the data we are being fed is not really uh, the same that originated it um, good news is that actually um, when I was trying to find the an advertisement like this, I couldn't find a recent one. So I'm hoping that this is something that stayed in the past and is no longer used uh, nowadays. So that was one way we can be misled by data, by cherry picking it. Another way is uh, the type, the way we aggregate the data. So especially nowadays where there's large amount of data, it's really difficult to look at each record of it, so we tend to summarize it. But the way we do it is going to tell a different story. And that's the example I want to show you now. So let's say I need to decide if the headphones I intend to buy are worth it. Usually we'd look at reviews. The problem, there are 4,000 reviews. There's no way I can look at each one and identify what the the review. So what we usually do is we summarize it. The most common way to do it is by using an average uh, or more specifically a mean, where what we do is we just sum up the review. In this case, it was the review from one to five, and then we just divide by the number of reviews. So for this particular scenario, those headphones uh, had a review uh, an average, a mean of 3.4, which, I mean, it gives me an idea that mm, maybe that's not the best headphones. Mm, maybe I can get something else. What if instead of looking at the mean, we were looking at the median? So another way of averaging, of aggregating those reviews. What is it? We line up the values in ascending order and we find the ones that are in the middle. So this helps us define what's, where's the 
Um, and when there's an odd number, then this is what we'll have to do, just the mean of that number, which in this case is five. So we would say the median of the reviews is five. And that tells a completely different story, right? And it tells us that 50% of the reviews are of five or higher, which gives me a bit more confidence than the 3.4 I saw before, right? So this is to show you that different ways of aggregating the data can definitely tell a different story and we need to be aware of it. Uh, there's another one, the mode. <laughs> Just going back to look at all the different averages. <laughs> uh, but there you go. So my favorite is if we can just combine the different types of aggregation and even show the distribution. So I think this is really the best way to get an informed decision. If not only do you have the summary, the aggregation, but you can also see the distribution. So how many people gave a rating of one? How many people gave a rating of five? And we can see that information now. So we had four people giving it a rating of one and six giving it a rating of six. So uh, six giving it a rating of five. So interesting uh, and definitely gives me a lot more information than if I was just focusing on the 3.4 or just on the five. Uh, here I have just a couple of screenshots from different online uh, places where we can see that Definitely, they have different approaches. Uh, I'm definitely a fan of the ones that show you the distribution rather than just something like this, where you, at least they give you how many reviews they had. That's good. <laughs> but um, there may be even some places where they simply give you what's the average and that's it. Okay. Final example coming in, which is the non zero based. Access. And actually, this example I showed you before for cherry picking also is guilty of that. Notice how our axis is not starting on zero. And that can be misleading because it basically is exaggerating the change in the data. So here we have a very, uh, I think for me, this is very clear that it makes a difference. So this is, again, in politics, <laughs> just, it's a bit old. It was in 2012, 2000, yeah, it was in 2012, because now um, was in 2012 and January 2013 was in the future at that time. And when we look at this chart, it looks like, oh, wow, it's going to be a really big increase. It looks like five times more, right? Notice the axis, it's starting at 34. So again, it's exaggerating that difference. If we were to use an axis starting from zero, this is what the chart looks like. Such a big difference, right? Suddenly, that difference is not that big uh, and it doesn't look like it's five times more. And here we go, we have our final example. I really hope this was uh, just created for the purpose of showing how the not having the axis starting at zero is misleading. I really hope this has never been used anywhere because in this example, it's even more wrong if that's possible. So in this example, we have 100% um, answer. So we have answers from 0 to 100. And um, so it's a percentage. And what happened here is we are truncating the yes part of it. So it looks like even though it's over 90, so it's over 93, suddenly the Persian of the yes just looks lower than the Persian of the no, right? So if we were looking at this picture, we would say, no, truncating the y-axis is not misleading at all. However, in the picture on the right, we can see that, yes, it really, really is misleading. So there we go. These were just um, a, couple, a couple of examples uh, of how data 
can be so useful, but if not displayed correctly, can also be misleading. And it's something to uh, be aware of and also make sure we are not doing this ourselves to when building visualization. Uh, so that's it. I'll pass over to Louise. And I hope that you can let me know in the chat of some other examples you've seen uh, so that we can all be shocked as well. Thank you. Thanks a million. That was great, Deborah. Thanks very much. And Mary's just saying lots of overlap between the two topics. It is interesting. You know, when I saw, when you think of the titles, um, it wasn't immediately obvious, but there's so much, yeah, there is just ethics plays a part there, doesn't it? And just trying to make sure that we're telling a true story with our data visualizations, as you had mentioned as well, Emma. Um, so thanks a million both. Um, there are a couple of questions. So anything else, um, the Q&A box is there if there are any other questions coming through. Um, so I'll get us started um, with the first one here from Jackie. So she's saying that was great, Emma. Um, so in your opinion, do you believe that there's an obligation for corporations and other entities to track granular lineage of their data outputs? So meaning, should they be able to kind of confirm at a row level how a particular data output was developed from source or just to ensure that the algorithm process is available for review? So it's kind of high level mm -hmm. versus low level. Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, thanks, Jackie. So I think for sure they need to be ensuring that their algorithm is available for review. but if you can get the lineage then it's going to make that process easier i guess the challenge is with some of the more recent machine learning models that are out there is they're quite complicated it, the, the, the guys themselves don't understand how they're being how, how data has been treated or, or decided upon within them so um that would be the challenge i would see there certainly with more simple models that we have if you can track the lineage of course it's going to make things a lot easier both from you know your own standpoint on just to make sure that the intent of what you were trying to do is being reached but also from a transparency um, and accountability perspective it makes it much easier but the challenge would be with a lot of the more sophisticated models out there when you start moving from machine learning into serious ai that's going to be more difficult to do very interesting thanks for that emma mm. um the next one's for you as well sorry putting you on the spot so in your um example about of proxy variables where the years of experience variable indicates an employee's age. Um, how would you mitigate that situation if you can't remove that proxy variable? So you might not be able to remove it from the data set, but you can you can modify your model to not take it into account or to not flag it as being a deciding variable within your um, within your system. So it might be something that you're capturing, and that's fine. But how the model is trained to use it and the importance it gives to that variable, you can modify. And that would be where I would probably direct the attention. It's the same problem with um, zip codes and things like that. They can give a lot of um, information to people. And, and in some cases, organizations do use them to nefariously target people in particular areas um, to approach them for loans or, you know, it, it tell, you know, start to sell them services that they may not need. And they can target them based on zip codes. Um, particularly people who are in a zip code that may have a lower socioeconomic background than others, um, they will modify their services towards them. So I think you you can collect the variable for sure. Um, how you train the model to use it is where you need to focus the attention. That makes sense. That yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Emma. Yeah, no, I think that's a good, um, yeah, that's great. Um, yeah, so much to think about, isn't there? When you think of what can be what, yeah, what can be derived from certain pieces of information. There's a lot. Yeah. Basically, we have so much data out there now that we're yeah. willingly giving and that also we have to give. Um, yeah. And has been collected. And then there's inferences. It might not even be data that you willingly give, but it could be somebody you know, and therefore you're associated with them and your data has been collected along with that. Um, so it is quite um, a bit of an ethical minefield. Um, and there's obligations even from the most basic um, work that you're doing with data to obviously the more sophisticated and the more intricate the work you're doing with the data, the more obligations are going to fall on you um, to be to treat it carefully and sensitively. Absolutely. Yeah. And I like that bit about minimizing data collection or something that you said along those lines. It's, you know, just because you can, we can do so much now, but that doesn't mean you, mm. you should do. Um, does anyone have any questions? Anyone else want to feed anything else through? Um, uh, people saying that was interesting and, and thanks um, to both of you. Um, yeah, 
I might just ask one then just um I kind of can put it to both of you so you can take it you know apply it um as relevant but just do you, do you see companies or just from what your exposure is I suppose do you see companies becoming more aware of the the risks around say ethics or you know you know just the challenges about gaps in data and that kind of thing so that would be to Emma I suppose more directly first um yeah absolutely because I think um there's, there's two reasons for it one people are becoming more aware of how their data is being used um and they're becoming more conscious about where it's going um you know even from the most basic from a, even if you're taking from a cyber crime perspective you want to know where your data is going who has it and how you're exposed there's an awful lot of information about you out there and um, so yes i think um companies for certain are, are looking more in this space but also as the companies mature on their data analytics journey and they start to move more from um, descriptive analytics into predictive analytics and they start to look at um, going down the data science route the capabilities that they have with the amount of data they're collecting um, in com combination in some cases with public publicly uh, available data um, are huge so they do need to think a bit more seriously about it and um, particularly i think the eu is probably at the forefront of this because of gdpr and the legislation they've put in the us is a bit more um is still lagging a little bit and um, it's very much up to the organizations themselves whereas the eu is trying to put a bit more central control on it it'll be interesting to see what the um, ai legislation around ethics how that influences the company's journey as well it's because i don't i can't think of a sector that isn't moving more towards analytics, even the financial sector is going down that I see every day, even on LinkedIn, you know, there's jobs and data and analytics here, there, you know, really in areas that you wouldn't have necessarily expect, expect them to be because you associated with being an IT role. There's a lot more in finance, supply chain, um, they're looking for those capabilities to help um, give them a competitive advantage. And to do that, they're going to move into data science. As soon as they start doing that, they open themselves up to a few more questions. As to yeah. how they treat the data and what they can do with it. Absolutely. Yeah, it's fascinating. Thanks for that. And then I suppose just to Deb Deborah, just in terms of company being aware in terms of visualization, I guess from training perspective, you're seeing people at different stages of their journey, but just being aware of those pitfalls and how visualizations can actually trick people, as you said. I, I do think so. Uh and I think not only people I feel like people when they start building visualizations looks like they are definitely worried about best practices and making sure that they are depicting data in the best way possible uh, and even uh, companies i think they're worried about it and trying to do it avoid misinformation and i i'll actually just share my screen again because i forgot to show you something i thought was really cool um i hope you can see my screen on the yeah. tweet yeah. Um, so this was the tweet I showed that was very misleading in Twitter. It I didn't know about it. It was when I accessed the tweet that it looks like Twitter has a context, um, which is written by people who use Twitter and appears when rated helpful by others. So this chart does come with the kind of the warning saying that it is deceptively formatted, showing only two data points. So I think there's more and more building these functionalities to bring awareness that sometimes the, the chart you are looking at is not really um, informing. I saw in, on Instagram, for example, as well, some warning saying, uh, for example, on COVID, uh, this may not be the best information, head over to this website to get the latest and uh, trustworthy information instead. So I do think that um, there's more uh, worries about this and that it's something that's being worked on, I hope. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. I suppose people are becoming more savvy and I suppose you can be misled with words, but you can be misled with, with charts and it's just about yeah. yeah, us all becoming more ethical and, uh, and aware as well. Thank you so much. So there's nothing else unless there's anything else coming through in the Q&A. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll close this. Uh, this session of Data Plus Women Ireland. Thank you so much to our speakers and to everyone who joined. It was great to have you here today. And um, the recording will be shared uh, on the Information Labs website. So thank you all so much. Have a good afternoon or evening or yeah. <laughs> and um, yeah, catch you all next time. Thanks, Millian. Thanks.
Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thanks.